Fox 13 presents Healthier Together, sponsored by Regents Blue Shield. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Jamie Tompkins. Coming up this half hour, we're going to take a look at some important health stories that impact so many of us. Everything from suicide loss to mental health and autism acceptance. First, on average, 130 people in the U.S. take their own lives every single day. And today, we're focusing on resources for suicide, suicide loss survivors. It's a group of people who don't often get a lot of attention, and they face an unfair stigma compared to other people grieving the loss of a loved one. Ian was hilarious. He was very funny. He was, he's someone that when, many times when people met him, even if they just met him once, they remembered him. Laura Nelson lost her son to suicide nearly 10 years ago. He was just 28 years old. It was quite shocking and very unexpected. There hadn't been a big buildup. We were in regular contact and he had a good living situation with friends and you know, it, there, were, there were no red flags. Laura found community and understanding through crisis connections. Laura's story was very common as well because so many people lose a loved one to suicide and they really didn't see any signs and there may not have been any signs there. CEO Michelle McDaniel says the purpose is to connect people in physical, emotional and financial crisis to services that can help. Just know that you are not alone, that you may feel tremendously isolated and alone, shame, guilt, confusion, all of that. This is um, this is what they call complicated grief um, and, and that is normal, but you are not alone, and I would say please try not to walk this journey alone. When a suicide does happen, despite prevention, despite family goodwill, despite the medical system or mental health system coming into play, then it's seen as a failure on everybody's part. And there's a lot of stigma in wanting to not look at that. That's in my opinion. There's a special stigma attached to suicide uh, and suicide loss survivors that that doesn't exist as far as I know in in other context. Laura has since turned her pain into purpose. The worst thing that could possibly happen to me happened. Now serving as a mentor through crisis connections. There's no one else to show you the way really you know there you suicide loss survivors have this commonality of of experience. There are people who are willing to talk and willing, more importantly, to listen. Whatever you're feeling is what you're feeling. Feelings um, might not be facts, but they're true in the moment and getting support is important. Your loss is your loss and should be grieved and can be grieved with an open heart and with help from others. For more information about Crisis Connections and the many services they provide, we've posted a link on our website, fox13seattle.com slash healthier together. You know, last year, emergency departments across the U.S. said they saw a dramatic increase in the number of kids ages 12 to 17 who either attempted to take their own lives or reported having suicidal thoughts. We spoke to a doctor regarding kids and their mental health and the warning signs parents need to look out for. As the school year comes to a close and kids head into summer, Dr. Jim Polo of Regents is sharing some tips to help children, teens, and young adults during these uncertain times. According to Dr. Polo, 15% of youth ages 12 to 17 have experienced a major depressive episode in the past year. According to the CDC, in 2021, more than a third of high school students reported poor mental health during the pandemic, and 44% reported feeling sad or hopeless during the past year. So what are some of the warning signs that a child is dealing with mental health issues? If a child is appearing sad, tired, or withdrawn, that can be an indicator that they're depressed. But if they're anxious, angry, or overwhelmed, that can be a sign of anxiety. Sometimes children and adolescent will not feel well. They'll complain of headaches or stomach aches or just tell you that they don't want to go to school. And sometimes they'll misbehave. 
So they'll break rules or not follow directions. And that can be one of the emotional stress. Dr. Polo says it's important for kids to maintain a daily routine, exercise every day, drink lots of water and stick to a healthy diet and also consider fun activities like summer camps and classes. And if your child or teenager is struggling emotionally, talk to your doctor or call 1-800-273-TALK. You can also text hello to 741-741. A new study reveals autism spectrum disorder keeps rising in the U.S. Researchers studied data from more than 12,000 children and teenagers between the ages of 3 and 17 who had been diagnosed with autism. They found the developmental disorder is rising across the U.S. They estimated the prevalence among children and teens was about 3.14 percent in both 2019 and 2020. They also said autism was higher among boys than girls nationwide. And researchers say reports of autism in the U.S. is higher compared to other nations worldwide. Today, we're taking time to highlight a local center focusing on life and social skills for adults living with autism. That includes everything from art to Zumba, movement to music. Students are finding friendship and independence. Don't let the gray exterior fool you. On the inside, you'll find a world of color, creativity, and cheer. This is a, a center that's really um, focused on serving people of all abilities. Seattle Children's Alyssa Burnett Adult Life Center in Bothell offers lifelong learning for people 18 and older with autism spectrum disorder and other developmental disabilities. Alyssa Burnett is really the, the inspiration uh, behind this whole program. She is the vision. Um, her, her parents, Barbara and Charlie, uh, saw a need and uh, she has been uh, kind of a pillar of excellence for us, a reminder of, to strive for better. Alyssa Burnett is a frequent visitor. As a young woman living with autism, her parents Charles and Barbara have worked for years to enhance the quality of life for adults living with developmental disabilities. We need to go beyond awareness into acceptance because, you know, at the end of the day, autistic people are, you know, we're just like everybody else. We're just like all you, we're just people, you know. We all have our hopes, our dreams. Over the years, the programs have grown and that requires space. Everything we're entering now, this was all nothing. So now we have three new classrooms and a new office space for staff. It's something we've always recognized is to, to really promote independence. Um, we needed an elevator to attach our first and second floor. So we're just very excited to make sure that our, our wheelchair users or those with mobility difficulties, that that's not a, not a barrier. We don't wanna make that a barrier for people enjoying classes, upstairs, downstairs, you name it. Um, so this is the pride and joy of, of our new build out for sure. The challenges don't end when a person turns 21 and ages out of school, but few programs are available to help these adults continue to learn, build skills and take part in a larger community. We want to make sure that we can serve all, all abilities, right? So within that comes those who might have more challenging or disruptive behaviors. We have a team of people who are here to support that. Uh, we have students who come highly independent, uh, students who come maybe one time a week just to take a dance class, um, all the way to students who come, you know, five days a week because they need to fill their week. So we're, we're designed on a 12-week quarter system so that families can kind of pick and choose what works for them. Peer connection is a key component as they work towards their mission of building a more inclusive community. I, you know, love what I do. I mean, it's one thing being a student, uh, you know, but there's only so much you can do as a student. Um, and being a staff, it, it, it's, it's really opened my eyes. This place helps fill a, a gap. It fills a piece of the pie, but we can never fill it all. And so I think it's um, underscoring the, the needs for more dialogue, more supports, more resources. No, they don't ever call you up and say, you know, your dad has Alzheimer's. It's a disease that affects more than 100,000 people in our state, and care for patients often falls on those closest to them. Coming up, some warning signs to look out for in your loved ones. Plus, vaccines for the youngest children are now widely available, but not everybody's lining up for the newly approved doses. We're going to hear from parents on both sides of the issue as COVID cases start to climb once again. COVID-19 was the third leading cause of death in the United States between March of 2020 and October of 2021. 
Researchers at the National Cancer Institute studied causes of death over that 20 month period and they found COVID-19 accounted for one in eight deaths in the U.S. during that time. Heart disease was the number one cause of death, followed by cancer. As cases of COVID-19 climb once again, we're learning that the CDC is now recommending people mask up in even more counties in our state. Pierce County has now joined the list considered high level according to the CDC. Thurston County also topping the CDC's high transmission list, along with Lewis, Pacific, Grace Harbor and Clallam counties. And the latest state health data says infants and toddlers have the highest COVID-19 case rates among children. And it's been two weeks since the vaccines became available for our youngest kids. Parents say some vaccine appointments are now scheduled as far out as September, while other families are waiting to decide if it's the right move for them. Fox 13 News reporter Jennifer Lee hears from a variety of voices on the pediatric vaccine. Hey, how was your day at school? He loves uh, any sports. He loves the Seahawks. He loves the Kraken. One, two, three. Henry is an active two and a half year old, and this weekend he'll be getting his first dose of the pediatric Moderna vaccine. I think he'll be pretty excited about it. He's a pretty easygoing guy. His dad, Jonathan Katz, says there are several reasons why the shot is right for them. You know, one of the big reasons isn't just for his health and safety, because that's obviously a big part, but also schools are going to be requiring it. We want to get him a COVID vaccine just so that it's not disruptive to his day and our work schedules is another important factor. Seattle King County Public Health says families should reach out to their pediatrician first, as many are giving the shots themselves. Kat says appointments are available, but finding one as soon as this week took some time. For kids that are under three, it's really, really hard because you can't take them to like Costco or any of the pharmacies or anything. You basically have to take them to a hospital like UW or Kaiser or basically a clinic that's running specifically for under kids under three. The latest COVID-19 information for children in Washington state actually says that children who are three and under have the highest case rates. That's about 400 per 100,000. And since the vaccine became available for children who are six months old to four years old, only about two and a half percent have started the process of getting a first dose. And we may get Camden done. Wow. We met the Tanner family at the Green Lake playground. The vaccine in Germany was a lot further behind than in America. Um, so when I visited America from Germany, I got the vaccine here. Camden's dad says vaccines for children five and under aren't yet available in Germany. Because we're here for four weeks, so we might be able to get it done tomorrow and then get the other shot. So we'll see. But I feel safe for sending him to school and having him mix amongst kids. And when he, so when he does get COVID, the symptoms are less, right? But parents like Carol Bravo say it's still too early for them and maybe in the future they'll reconsider. There's not enough information yet for that group, which is kind of like a sensitive group still when they're still kind of growing and everything. So I guess that's what it is. Jennifer Lee, Fox 13 News. If you're looking for an appointment, you can search for them by going on the state's vaccine locator page. We have that link and others on our website, fox13seattle.com. Over the next several months, the Alzheimer's Association will host several walk to end Alzheimer's events, including ones in Seattle, Everett and Tacoma. Meantime, a local family is sharing their experience with Alzheimer's in the hopes of helping other families impacted by the disease. Oh, it's them again. They both are aware enough that they need help. No, they don't ever call you up and say, you know, your dad has Alzheimer's. They don't do that. Ann Callahan is talking about her aunt, Mariella. Oh, you got a haircut today, didn't you? And her father, Tom. Over time, it became obvious that that was definitely something off because he was a pilot. He could navigate anywhere. Both brother and sister were diagnosed with Alzheimer's and now reside at Quail Park Memory Care. Our residents, they, some of them come to us and they're 93, right? So they've been caring for themselves for 80 years, you know, and during moments of lucidity, realizing that you're losing that independence and control of your life and, and environment is very, very difficult. In Tom and Mariella's cases, Anne says she's learned a lot as a caregiver. It's a really hard job, including the importance of having power of attorney. If there's any way at all, you can be on their checking accounts do that 
because it makes your life so much easier when you have to start managing their finances. The top five early signs of Alzheimer's include memory loss, challenges with problem solving, difficulty completing familiar tasks, confusion, and difficulty with balance or distance, according to Dr. Drew Oliveira with Regents Blue Shield. New things are hard to integrate into your, your sphere of known um, things and your sphere of known things is shrinking anyway. 120,000 people in Washington, 65 or older, were living with Alzheimer's as of 2020 and that number is projected to jump to 140,000 by 2025. That's according to the Alzheimer's Association of Washington. Sometimes he'll call me around six or seven in the evening and say that things are really terrible and he doesn't know what these people are doing and, and I need to come and get him. But then if I talk to him in the morning, everything's just fine. Ann says she's just grateful her dad and her aunt have each other and a place to call home that can meet their needs. Memory care just, I think, operates on the presumption that um, we have people who are progressing and they're progressing in the direction of doing less and less and less. And so we as a facility are here to provide more and more and more. Experts say it's important to start talking about the disease early on and also get permission for loved ones in advance to speak with doctors and lawyers about your care and your personal business. Coming up, we often hear about the third trimester of pregnancy, but have you ever heard of the fourth trimester? What it is and how one doctor is hoping to help moms with an app. It's an issue that affects so many women, but one we don't really talk about because it can be extremely personal. Liz DeWicke spoke with a doctor about pelvic organ prolapse, what it is, and how to look for warning signs. All right, joining me now is Dr. Pinky Patel. Dr. Patel, good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. Thanks for being with us. So June is pelvic organ prolapse month. Talk a little bit about what that means. Yeah, so I think it's really um, important to kind of highlight what pelvic organs or the pelvic floor is before we jump into pelvic organ prolapse. The pelvic floor is essentially something, it's a group of muscles, right? It's kind of like a hammock that's sitting inside of your body. And it's usually a bunch of muscles and tissues and they hold your pelvic organs in place. So that's pretty much like your bladder, your uterus, your vagina and your rectum. And so whenever women are of childbearing age or are new moms, I always emphasize strengthening the pelvic floor. Now, pelvic organ prolapse is essentially, prolapse just means like the descending of organs. So that refers to the drooping of any of those pelvic floor organs through the pelvic floor. Oh, wow, okay. And you also, you talk about the fourth trimester of pregnancy. Why is it so important to talk about that? You know, I have two children myself, a five-year-old and a two-year-old, and I felt like, you know, during my first pregnancy, pre I feel like pregnancy is one of those times where someone's holding your hand all the time and you have a bunch of resources, and then postpartum kind of, it kind of comes, you know, like a slap in the face where, everyone's supporting you in pregnancy and then you kind of fall off this cliff and everyone's holding your hand all of a sudden they let go and then you're sent home with the baby and essentially I feel like a mom is born again right so um I feel like the fourth trimester often goes without a lot of preparation and that is one of the most challenging times in a woman's life yeah, I mean, when, when it comes to that time, and the way you explained it, I think was perfect. I mean, you, you kind of feel like you're falling off a cliff there. I mean, how early should women start thinking about that postpartum recovery? You know, as I feel like pregnancy is the best time because I always say pregnant princess, postpartum peasant. And so it's one of those things where pregnancy, we're focusing on the registry, we're focusing on the mattresses and what we're gonna have um, for the baby and for ourselves. But I think we should think beyond the materialistic side of things and maybe focus on who's going to be supporting me during that postpartum period where am i going to get my meals from who's going to help me do the small things around the house like those small things really add up so i think that pregnancy is a perfect time if not before uh do you mind uh just talking a little bit about the snapback? that's something you created how did that come about 
Yeah, so I am a clinical pharmacist by trade, but I'm also a pre and postnatal certified trainer. And so before having my daughter, I found it really unusual that folks just reference postpartum as one of those things where, hey, you're going to just live with peeing on yourself, which is stress and urinary incontinence. You're going to live with lower back pain. And I thought from an anatomical and science perspective that that didn't make sense. Like, why are we living with these things? These things are, they're common, but they're not normal. And so I started learning that in other countries, they have access access to free physical therapists that come to their home prior to them being cleared for exercise. And whenever I had my daughter, I felt like, yes, I was equipped in a way of like for rehab and recovery, because I am a trainer myself. But in addition to that, I felt like there were a bunch of resources that were missing. So the snapback is essentially an all in one postpartum assistant app that I wish existed when I had both of my children. And the bread and butter of that app is the rehab and recovery. So instead of treating women as one size fits all, the app actually has a algorithmic rehab and recovery program, where depending on how you delivered your baby first, second, third degree tear, PZ or a C-section, which all of those things matter when we talk about the recovery of women, that delivers their experience. So instead of just mm -hmm. being magically cleared for movement at six weeks postpartum, we instead approach the female body a little differently. Okay, so how can people find more information on that? Yeah, so there's the snapback.com and there's also an Instagram profile that we have and also on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Awesome, this is great information. Dr. Pinky Patel, thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you so much for joining us for this special edition of Healthier Together. And remember, you can learn more about all of these stories and others on our website, fox13seattle.com slash healthiertogether.